What I've tried to do since this horror began six months ago now is to try and elevate the voices that I think we desperately need to hear. And I'm really proud, given that, to be joined by a really fascinating and insightful guest today, uh, who's Khalil uh, Sayek, who is a Palestinian from Gaza. Um, he's a Christian. Uh, there is a very small, embattled uh, Christian minority in Gaza. And we'll talk about that, though um, I know having... Uh, spoken to you, you obviously above all else see yourself as, as a Palestinian it's important that we talk about that as well in, in the course of the discussion um but has had a, a really fascinating kind of trajectory I suppose um having gone to uh, Bethlehem in the West Bank um and now is in the United States has worked with we'll, we'll talk about this some kind of uh, Christian um pro-israel groups and and the impact that's had on you in, in I suppose your political journey. Um, your family are at the moment, of course, in Gaza, and I should say um, that your father obviously died in the course of this horror. So we'll talk about that. So, given the huge trauma that you and obviously so many other Palestinians are going through right now, it's a big honour to be joined by you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Owen. I'm really an honour to be with you. Can you just tell me a bit about your upbringing, where in Gaza you were born, and I suppose your just experience growing up. Um, when at the time the IDF was still in military occupation of Gaza, um, and this was before the rise of Hamas. So do you want to tell me just about your kind of earlier years? Sure, yeah. So I was born to a middle-class family in the Gaza city, in particular in the west of Gaza. I mean, uh, those of you who were following the news, the west of Gaza was the, the, the part of the Gaza Strip that was bombarded the most in this war. It was actually the place where it started, uh, uh, you know, when you hear about Shifa Hospital, when you hear about uh, Rimal neighborhood, all of that is, is in, within uh, the west of Gaza. That's where I grew up. But I was also born to a family that are considered a refugee, a family that uh, our grandparents have experienced the ethnic cleansing of 1948. And uh, living in Gaza, and to, in that context, you inherit a lot of trauma and you inherit a lot of uh, greednesses and uh, certain feelings that you have uh, uh, about uh, uh, the situation and the context that you were born into. Uh, when the Israelis were still in Gaza, I do remember very vividly that uh, it impacted our life in all sorts of, uh, of ways. I mean, we're, we're talking about a few thousand settlers that were in Gaza, yet to protect them, uh, there, have, there have been uh, hundreds of, uh, I mean, maybe hundreds, I mean, maybe tens of thousands of soldiers in Gaza who really made our life very, very hard and very difficult. I mean, one of the early memories I had of the Israeli occupation in Gaza is that my teachers uh, at UNRWA schools wouldn't be able to come from the southern part of the Gaza Strip to the schools and thus the classes would be cancelled. Why? Because the Israeli occupation has closed the checkpoints. Sometimes people will have to take five or six hours to move from the south part of the Gaza Strip to the uh, um, uh, to Gaza City. So it really, really had impacted our life in all, all sorts of ways. But my first interaction or first memory of the Israeli occupation in Gaza was in the Second Intifada when the Israeli helicopters and air forces bombarded Gaza and particularly bombarded the uh, presidential res uh, residence of uh, former President Yasser Arafat. Can you tell just about that? Because obviously, I mean, I think a lot, I, I spoke yesterday to a brilliant James Elder, spokesperson for UNICEF um, in Rafa. And um, I, I just, it's difficult to process the trauma now, children growing up in Gaza, the impact of what they're going through. It's just so unimaginable. But so many young Palestinians have grown up with so many, you know, obviously not on the scale, anywhere near the scale today, but still hmm. horrific. I mean, just the impact of, of being a child and growing up with being bombarded from the air, you know, these, these sorts of horrors, which for many people who live in the global north actually is quite hard to imagine, I think. But as a child, can you just tell me the kind of the impact? You know, the first time you're shocked and you're scared and you're traumatized and you run to your parents asking them what is happening and your body is literally shaking, uh, you wonder who is this enemy that's trying to kill us. Uh, the second time, perhaps the same thing happened. And the third time, at least in my experience, it became so normalized that you think of yourself as some sort of superhero, right? So but this part of the national collective 
uh, self understanding of resilience that even our children can uh, stand in front of the air force bombardments etc and you start feeling that instead of running away from the air force bombardments uh, we would run toward it to see what's happening and i remember myself as a child running toward uh, the 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 places where israel would assassinate people at that time they would used to target cars in particular it was against you know a uh, Fatah member, Hamas members, or other to assassinate them in car. And I remember as a child, I would run to see what's happening there. So for so long, I thought I'm not traumatized. I don't have any um, really uh, uh, trauma or, or or things that will perceive there as weakness. But then it took me years to realize that, no, I'm traumatized. And I'm very, very traumatized. And I have a very deep fear. And that's not weakness to acknowledge. I remember that... Uh, when I traveled out of Gaza for the first time, I mean, when 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 I came here to the U.S., the first time I heard a helicopter, and I uh, I was really, really, really terrified because what what my body starts shaking and I start just remembering all these memories of the helicopter targeting Gaza. I don't live far from the airport here in Washington D.C., and every time I hear a flight, until now, sometimes my body just react in a way that is very scared of the bombardment, like. Am I about to die right now? And I have to remind myself that no, you're 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 living in Washington. There's no one to bomb you here. You're out of that danger. So yes, there is there is a trauma. And there is really deep trauma. And I would say even maybe more for the people who lived after uh, the time that I left the Gaza Strip. I left Gaza in 2009. Lived in Ramallah and Bethlehem for the last um, uh, ten years, and then 2001 I moved here to Washington. Can you tell me just in terms of as a Christian growing up in Gaza, both before and obviously the rise of Hamas in the mid 2000s? So growing up as a Christian, I mean, obviously, in the very early f- years of your childhood, you never really feel that you are uh, different than anyone else. I mean, we look as the, we're from the same race, the same ethnicity as the, our Muslims, brothers and sisters. We look the same. We have the same national identity, same flag. We're very proud to be Palestinians. We see that our oppressor, uh, and our enemy is the same. It's the state of Israel who oppressed us in 48, who are still oppressing us right now. But then you start uh, growing up and you start feeling uh, that you're different. And I remember my first uh, interaction to the uh, different uh, that uh, of being Palestinian Christian is going to honor school and then realizing that people would sometimes even laugh at me or, uh, or you know, mock me or um, uh, make fun of my faith. And although I wasn't like a vocal Christian at the time, but like just from my the la- my last name, I mean, not my last name, my middle name, which is my father's name, Jurius, who's actually uh, named after the saint of Palestine, uh, St. George, and uh, they would just laugh and, 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 and you know, uh, think that it's funny that there's such a thing as Christian because they don't understand. And I would describe that experience usually, it's a very similar to the experience of... Uh, uh, minorities here in the south of the United States, in a certain part of the year. I mean, I met a lot of uh, uh, Jewish people who grew up, let's say, in Texas or Kentucky, and they had a very similar experience during uh, school or places where there are no really Jewish people. So it's a similar experience. But then with the rise of Hamas uh, in Gaza, uh, there started all sorts of questions being asked by Palestinian Christians. What does it mean to be a Palestinian Christian when you have an illiberal Islamist regime in the rise? Hamas itself did not have an answer for what does it mean to be a Palestinian distinctively from the Islamist framework, because uh, it seemed that Hamas's identity of what it means to be a Palestinian is connected to the uh, uh, relationship to Islam, but they really defined what is our role. So we started asking ourselves, would Hamas now uh, uh, ask us to uh, uh, be in a second class uh, citizen sort of thing. Would they ask us to be jizya as other Islamists in the in, in, in the world have have asked, etc. But we were actually surprised rather that Hamas has actually provided protection for Christians, uh, to churches, to other spaces. Now, although on a security level, Hamas has um, protected the Christians and made sure that, for example, Salafist groups wouldn't attack them, and Salafists have tried to attack Christians and Hamas was the main protector of Christians. On the other hand, the gradual Islamization of society that Hamas has produced as it came there has made life harder for Palestinian Christians than any other groups there because all of a sudden the the public square is becoming more Islamized and it's not a very welcoming space for Christians. But I would say not only for Christians, but also for secular Muslims or people who don't want to adhere to our religion, the Islamization of society has proven a very... Uh, uh, challenging for this for those groups. Um, you were in Bethlehem, weren't you, with uh, Munzer Isaac, who people may know. I've interviewed Munzer Isaac myself. Um, he's a Palestinian Christian theologian 
who did a sermon um, at Christmas, which went viral internationally, where he spoke out against genocide in Gaza um, and condemned the silence of people who didn't speak out and how history would consider them. Could you just, t- just tell me a bit about Bethlehem and, and, and kind of the impact of that experience? Sure, yeah. So after I moved to the West Bank, I became more religious. I had uh, some moment of like coming to Jesus sort of thing, and I became uh, more religious. I was always like uh, just Christian by name. I was never adhered to any uh, particular uh, 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 tradition of faith. And uh, although my family is Orthodox Christian, I never really practiced Christianity. There in in uh, uh, the West Bank, I became more religious, and it was through a group of uh, Protestant missionaries. And then I felt the call to go to Bethlehem Private College and study theology. And that's where I met Munder. He was the, uh, before he became the academic dean, actually, he was my professor. And I remember uh, studying with him, first class was the Book of Exodus. And we had to ask all sorts of questions uh, about, uh, obviously, the context of the Book of Exodus and uh, uh, slavery and the Israelites, etc. But we had to also ask questions about uh, what does it mean in the Palestinian context. And I remember thinking uh, of the text, and that, that's a paper that I wrote at that time, of uh, what does it mean to be oppressed as, as a group and then calling God to deliver you out of this oppression. Because for Palestinians, and I think theologians like Munder Isaac would say that uh, they read in the Palestinian um, context that we are the oppressed and they read themselves into the text too of what's happening, uh, sorry, of what have happened in the book of Exodus, such as uh, 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 calling God to deliver us out of, uh, of oppression. With so you, you moved then afterwards, didn't you, to the United States? Um, where, can you just explain when? How? When did you move to the US? And and, and what? You know, what was the the bait? Because you were there to do postgraduate studies. Yeah, for I, I lived in the West Bank for over ten years, and um, uh, obviously I did my studies. I, I was working in the US as well. Um, my first visit to the US was 2018. It was just a work trip to speak at some churches, etc. I was really very involved in the Christian sort of Protestant world at that time, and then I uh, I started thinking that I really don't want to be in the uh, world of theology. I didn't feel that I was pure enough to be a theologian or to be a pastor or to be a, a man who would like uh, do religious duties. And I felt that I want to come to study political science. So I came to American University here in Washington, D.C. about three years ago. And I finished my studies and then I got a job. I was working for, for a year. And my thinking was like, I would just work one year here, get some training, go back to the West Bank and work in the West Bank for a couple of years, maybe teach at university or something come back and get a PhD. I tried to go, and all of a sudden, I realized that Israel did not allow me to go back to the West Bank. Uh, for 10 years, I lived in the West Bank. I established my entire life uh, uh, between Ramallah and Bethlehem. I, I, I left Gaza thinking that just that's where I want to be. I don't want to leave Palestine, but at the same time, I can't live in Gaza under the siege, and there even Hamas is a authoritarian regime, etc. But all of a sudden, the occupation did not allow me to go back to Gaza, uh, sorry, to go back to the West Bank. Uh, the, the only option I had is to go back to Gaza, which to me wasn't a starter. I, so I find myself going back to the U.S., and here I am seeking an asylum because I don't have a place to go back to. And have I went back even to Gaza, now we lost everything. Toward the very beginning of this war, my family house was bombed. Uh, the, our family uh, historical uh, jewelership in Gaza also was bombed. Uh, our churches were bombed in Gaza, indeed, or part of the churches were bombed. So we've got nothing to leave, to go back to in Gaza. Before, I mean, I'll obviously ask you about the, the horror that's been unleashed against Gaza. I mean, one thing I should have asked as well before is about the siege of Gaza, which you just mentioned there. Can you just tell us just that, that what that was like growing up, well, living under that siege? Sure. I mean, the siege has completely devastated uh, Gaza and devastated the economy of Gaza. Uh, people start not even having, uh, being able to make uh, their their daily life uh, needs uh, during, especially during the, the peak of it, which was from 2007 to 2000, um, to 2010, or at least the days that were, I was there. Electricity will come out of the 24 hours of the day, only six hours, and they could come while you are asleep, actually. So, so you can imagine what does this mean in terms of like having food in the refrigerator and, and at uh, at your home or uh, uh, access to internet, TV, etc. It was really, really, really difficult. Uh, there were all sort of food uh, that were forbidden from coming from Gaza, such as chocolate. Chocolate was considered something dangerous apparently for Israel. You cannot have it in Gaza, etc. And this, I think, pushed also an alternative economy in Gaza. So you're thinking that the Israelis were claiming that, oh, we are having that siege to 
uh, uh, weakening Hamas. We want to punish Hamas. We're not really collectively punishing the Palestinians. But that's false. That's completely false. It was to punish the Palestinian people collectively. They were literally counting the calories of the Palestinian people. But not only that, Israel was well aware that at the same time they are sieging Gaza, Hamas have found a new uh, venture, which is they started building tunnels with on the border with Egypt and they start building all this alternative economy that empowered more and more elites who are closer to Hamas. So yes, you want to weaken Hamas. So what you ended up doing, you weakened all this middle class, all those upper class who were relatively more secular, relatively more connected to the Palestinian Authority, and even some of them had partner businesses in, in Israel, Tel Aviv, etc. And you empowered these new businesses that are based on the tunnels that are based on paying taxation to Hamas, and they became the, the prominent uh, new middle class and upper class in Gaza. Can you explain why Israel banned you from going back to the West Bank? So the life of the Palestinians in general is controlled by what's so-called per, per, uh, re regime permits. You need a permit to do anything. You need a permit to leave from the Gaza Strip to visit the West Bank on Easter or, or, or Christmas if you are a Christian. You need a permit to go and pray in Al-Aqsa Mosque if you are a Palestinian Muslim. And by the way, if you are from Gaza, it's impossible for you to pray at Al-Aqsa Mosque. If you are from the West Bank, maybe they'll give you a permit. The permits are system to control your life. And not only to control your life, it's to control the demography of, of, of what is known as Israel and Palestine today. So for the Palestinians who live in Gaza, you are not allowed to move to the West Bank. But once they give you a permit for one week or two weeks, you can just go visit, and sometimes you stay there. It's supposed to be like, you know, it's part of the Palestinian territories, under international law, etc. It's the same state. So me, 2009, when I moved from Gaza to the West Bank, I received what's so-called Easter permit. Uh, it was an Easter of 2009. And I moved to the West Bank on this two weeks permit. Two weeks after I stayed there, actually, a law was passed by the Israeli army that those who move from Gaza or have moved from Gaza to the West Bank are considered illegal. So all of a sudden I became illegal in the West Bank, in my own country, and the Israeli army would debar back anyone who lives in the West Bank uh, with, with a Gaza ID. So for 10 years I lived in fear that the Israeli army will, will, will send me back to Gaza. So I'd be scared even to go to villages around Ramallah where I lived, mm -hmm. or to move between Bethlehem and Ramallah. However, 2018, I received the permit for the first time. They call it Ishurli Yehuda Bishamron, a permit to, to Judea and Samaria, which is the West Bank, obviously. That's what the occupation call it. And it's a yearly permit that is renewed. I thought that I'm safe. Once I have this permit, I would just always be able to access the West Bank and live there. Uh, but you can imagine, after 10 years, <laughs> you just got this permit. After 10 years, of, of living there. And then all of a sudden I come to the US and they cancel my permit. So I try to go back and they say, oh, well, you're from Gaza, go back to Gaza. But that's that's not unprecedented. That's not about Khalil. That's how tens of thousands of Palestinians who are from Gaza live in the West Bank. But, but take this, Jones, not only that, since October 7th, there has been thousands of Palestinians like myself from Gaza who live in the West Bank or had permit to access to the West Bank who are now in jail for only the guilt of having an ID that says Gaza on the address. People are being stopped at checkpoints today in the West Bank for having an ID of being from the from Gaza and being tortured, being put yeah. in a specific yeah. jail where there is no food or no water or no warm clothes to have. Mm. So, I mean, it's horrific. And I think just these are just facets of the occupation, which I think people often aren't even aware of. And um, it's just so important to discuss, obviously. I mean, you, you, you in the US then, so you weren't able to go to the West Bank for the reasons you've explained. You ended up actually working and be, uh, became involved with Christian conservatives. You were obviously staunchly pro-Israel. Um, I mean, I'm just interested in your kind of, your political journey. I'm always fascinated with people's political journeys. But can you just tell me about that and the impacts that had and, and kind of what it opened your eyes to, I suppose? Sure, yeah. So actually, it's, it's, it's fascinating because I worked for these groups before I came to the US, actually. I was a contractor while in the West Bank, about around 2016 or so. I was uh, like 21, 21 years old. And obviously, when I worked for, for these groups, I wasn't aware of all these view, their views. Uh, I was approached by someone. He said, what you talk about in terms of uh, Palestinian Christian persecution, that, that sort of like, you know, illiberalism of Hamas, the Islamism, uh, etc., is very fascinating. There are very few people who are willing to talk about that. And we think you're brave, you should work with us on this. Now, obviously, 
I knew that they have a certain views on Israel, but they said that's a, not the center of our life, etc. And we said, yeah, we can work together as long as we th- as long as we talk about everyone who's causing troubles for the Christians or religious minorities or the broader peace and stability in the region. Yeah, we, we would work together. But it doesn't take me a long time, uh, although I was not aware of American political uh, environment or the Western uh, uh, thoughts in general and Christian Zionism, etc. It didn't take me a long time to realize that it's very clear that these people are not only interested about uh, amplifying Christian voices and uh, and the rights and uh, the plight of, of of Palestinian Christians and the broader Christian uh, minority in the Middle East, which is a very real problem, by the way. That the, the idea that we're facing an illiberalism that threatens our existence in the region is a very real problem. But it turns out, uh, from my point of view, that these people are not really interested in that as much as they are interested in uh, painting a certain Orientalist view that only the only problem that exists in the Middle East, the only problem that exists in that region is the persecution of, of, of Christians from Muslims. But not only that, these groups are funded, not even some of them, not funded even by, by Christians. They're funded by, by a particular uh, uh, Zionist uh, uh, businessmen and entity. And the entire theme or the goal of it is to distract from the role of the occupation that plays in that, in that, in that area and the role of Western invasions sometimes, uh, sorry, invasions and Western uh, bad wars there. And that I came to that realization, but you know, at the same time, uh, it was too late. <laughs> it was too late in the sense that, oh, I'm already in it. And I had to yeah. wait and strategically think, when is it the time to make a leave uh, from uh, uh, the connection to these institutions? But at the same time, I will, I'll be honest, I have interacted with a lot of people and those who are not like the elites or the leaders of these institutions who are sincerely, sincerely trying to do the, the right thing. They're not really coming out of racism or orientalism that want to do this. They really believe they want to help Palestinian Christians. They really believe they want to help the persecuted Christian in the region. However, they're being used by these uh, elites who are for a very particular ideological and financial reasons, uh, pushing a certain agenda that harms the Christians in the Middle East and harms also, I would argue, Western uh, values and Western uh, interest in the region as well on the long term. So, I mean, for a while it felt, I mean, they were kind of manipulating or trying to manipulate, for example, Christian Palestinians to to advance a particular cause in support. For of sure. Well. Yeah, for sure. And, and and that's the issue. The issue is within the light of polarization in the West, in the light of the polarization in the West, a Palestinian Christian or a religious minority, let's say a Yazidi from Iraq even, he has to be put between the two polarized groups in the U.S. that neither of them is interested to hear your story. And I will tell you, I was beaten up and thrown in jail twice by Hamas. Once because I was more on the Fatih side and I was wearing a kofiya during Yasser Arafat Memorial in 2008. I was literally beaten up and thrown in jail as a 14 years old in Gaza. And that's mm-hmm. a story that the left generally is not interested in hearing. Because how dare you? You say that Hamas, who are the resistance, have any any uh, authoritarian tendency on the other hand uh, uh um, the, the 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 right is happy to take that they're very happy oh well you're saying about the muslims that they did such and such and that to persecute you also because you're christian because i also had that but then you say but well i was beaten up more than 15 times and that's true because i'm from gaza more than 15 times in the west bank i was stopped because i am from Gaza and beaten up by Israeli soldiers for no reason, just because my ID say Gaza. More than 15 times I was beaten up by them. That's not the story the right is interested to hear, but the left is interested to, to hear. So you find yourself in the middle and stuck. No one from these groups wanna listen to you. And you end up, you have to make strategic choices sometimes on who to be with. Obviously, once you grow up, you have more an academic career and you have more accumulated knowledge, you find places where you can walk this fine line between the two polarized groups. But in general, the unfortunate reality is that a Christian from Iraq or a Christian from Palestine or generally the minorities in the region, they have a very, very, very tough choices to make between denying one or another part of their identity and experience. Can I ask it just obviously in terms of what's happened since 7th of October? So when 7th of October happened, you must have known that a horror was going to be unleashed against Gaza and your family were there. So you just talk me through that. Absolutely. To start with, 7th of October did not surprise me personally. What have surprised me is that the Palestinian 
violent response toward the Israel occupation and apartheid have said, taken so long. By no means this is a justification of everything that happened on October 7. I'm obviously terrified by some of the things that have taken place. Uh, the humanitarian international law was broken in October and October, and it's horrifying for me, a defender of Palestinian human rights. But the idea that the Palestinians can be passive for so long, where they are subject to such a violent and brutal occupation, it's just, it's just, it's just. I don't know where it's coming from. It's an measure. It's stupid. That's not human. Human nature works. Before October seventh, we already seen the most violent year in the Palestinian history since the Second Intifada. More than two hundred and thirty Palestinians were killed in the West Bank. So actually, I was speaking at an event two weeks before October seventh, and I said, there will be a bloodbath. There will come a point where things would change only because there will be a huge break of violence, and you guys will regret the Biden policy that assumes that you can just ignore the Palestinians and go talk to the Saudis and to the others. So October 7 happened, and I also see, obviously was horrified by what I seen and all the stories that came out about civilians being killed, etc. But I was also more terrified but because I, I, I knew what the response on Gaza would be. I thought that this is, this is it, things will go bad. But I did not imagine it to go as bad as it is right now, to be honest. I thought that at least the world can hold Israel to a certain standard, where do we enough? I did not expect that 33,000 people were being killed. I did not expect that all the hospitals of the northern part of Gaza would be destroyed. I did not expect that my own father will pass away because of Israeli soldiers who were surrounding the church at that time, prevented him from uh, going to uh, a hospital or that ambulances would, would uh, access that area. I did, I, I did not expect all these brutalities. In a way, my entire belief in the system of international law, international uh, rights, um, sorry, international law, humanitarian law, etc., has been collapsing since October 7 in the way uh, 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 the, the uh, Israeli war uh, and genocidal attack on Gaza has been conducted since then. I mean, just to begin, you know, talk me through, you know, a, a lot of people watching this now will be in their homes. Um, and people obviously remember the homes in which they grew up it's actually the house you grew up is very much a part of your own identity it's part of your sense of self um even long after you've you've, you've left i mean when you found out about your house being destroyed what went through your heads and what also in terms of the claims i mean you know 70 percent or so six seventy percent have been of of in civilian infrastructure has been severely damaged or destroyed gaza looks a different color and texture when looked at from satellites in space now um, but yeah, just the impact of knowing about your home and then any, how you fit that in with the, the claims now, which are kind of ludicrous to even say about these are targeted attacks. And if, if, if homes are blown up like your own, it's because of, uh, for example, human shields. Yeah, there, there, there's two things here. I mean, a like on an, in an emotional and, um, uh, uh, personal level, I felt completely hopeless. The fact that I, I, my mom calls me crying that our home has been bombed and that they are in the, sorry, that they are in the street and have no place, it, it shattered my heart. It was very hard mm. for me to hear. Mm. And also it restored all these memories that I used to hear from my grandpa. In 48, uh, when my uh, grandparents were forced to leave the city of Majda, uh, within historical Palestine, today there is an Israeli city that, that is there called Ashkelon. I do remember my grandpa and how he felt and how he spoke always about how much property he owned there, him, how much land, how much uh, two gold jobs that he've had, one in Majda, one in Ramli. It felt the very same to me. It was the first time I feel what does it mean to lose your home in the literal sense. I always knew about the homeland, but to lose the home, the place where your parents and your uh, brothers and sisters will go in, and sleep there in a Palestinian culture and also like generally the Arab cultures in that area, a home is a place where collectively you come together and you build it over years. You invest money above money. Sometimes it's it's like a uh, hundred times of, uh, of your income to put it in one home so you don't have to pay rent and that you feel place that you will be uh, safe. And all of this was shuttered on that, on that level. Now on the uh, uh, question about human shields, etc. obviously this is ridiculous. The uh, bombardment was indiscriminate. Uh, in the case of my family, my family actually, by, by chance or by a miracle, uh, they survived the, the bombardments of our home because the home next to ours have uh, received an ev evacuation order. 
uh, my parents said, okay, we'll go to the street, stand for a few seconds. So until they bomb the, the house next to us. So they went to the street, they bombed the house next to them and two, like less than one minute after they bombed our home as well. So my family could have even not left the home and they could have been dead right now. It's by miracle that them and their neighbors have have left the place. So it's completely uh, uh, ridiculous that it's it's targeted. And also the Israelis themselves after that, they've said it, that we are targeting what's so-called of our uh, uh, targets, that we will just like an AI would generate targets and they will just bomb them without any reasons or justification militarily to bomb these places. Can you tell me just a bit about your dad? Because I mean, you know, losing your father in that, those circumstances are, is is horrible. And also, you know, it speaks to just how terrible the, the death toll may well end up being as horrific as it already is, in that there are the violent killings, the people who are killed by bombs and by bullets. Um, and we don't know exactly what that number is because so many are buried under rubble and classified as missing. Um, so the official death toll was a actually an underestimate, obviously, rather than an overstatement, which yeah. is how obviously Israel's defenders have tried to claim it. But then there are those who die who wouldn't have died were it not for what's happened. And, you know, it's a clinical term, but we call it excess deaths, obviously, for those, I'm sure people listening might, might have heard that term, um, which is, um, you know, there are projections of, you know, by August, 120,000 Palestinians, according to one academic study, could be killed in Gaza. And that includes people through violent means, but also people who don't get medical attention who need medical attention so can you tell obviously about your dad and you know see it's a very traumatic thing for you to to, to to go through so bearing that mind as i as i ask you sure yeah i mean obviously to lose a father is is, is a really difficult thing and to lose him in this situation and you cannot be able to go visit him or visit his grave or even go to the burial and to the even the divine liturgy that we do in the Orthodox uh, Church is very, very difficult for me. Uh, uh, um, I, I just like can't express how how hard this has been on me. I mean, my father have lived through through a lot. He was born in the fifties. Uh, he lived it through the sixty seven war. I remember my father telling me a story of the first time he decided to study Hebrew and understand Hebrew actually, and it was because the Israeli soldiers have arrested him from the streets in Gaza for no reason and they beat him up. And he was listening to them talking things in Hebrew, and he uh, took a decision himself that I would go and work hard to understand their language and I will understand what what the hell they're 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 uh, talking about. But despite all of that, my dad was all about actually uh, living in peace with everyone, about justice, about uh, 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 freedom for everyone, and he never ever uh, told me that we 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 have to fight we have to like you know that there's no room to live with the other but he always said that there is a solution and it can be achieved a two-state solution or another but that we we, we should uh, live together in peace but for his life to end in this way it's a really really a tragic uh, 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 and, and I would say even it symbolizes the tragedy of what is uh, the life of Palestinians even those who uh, uh, support peace and support coexistence would look like he died as he had a heart attack or panic attack uh, two days after the Israeli snipers has claimed the life of two Christian women at the Catholic church where he was staying and also have shot in the lower bodies eight people who tried to save these two women. Uh, the tragedy uh, that we don't even know if it was a heart attack or panic attack because he was not able to access a medical center. He was not able to access hospital. Why? two reasons. The first is that Israel at that time has devastated all the healthcare system in Gaza, from Al Mahmadani Hospital to the Shifa, etc. They were all shut down. Second reason is because Hayya Zaytun, the Zaytun neighborhood where, where they were and where the churches were surrounded by Israeli tanks, and no ambulances were were um, uh, uh, um, uh, allowed to, to to access there. And the sad part is that perhaps my father's story is perhaps my father is lucky enough that I, I am out there and I'm speaking in English, I'm telling war, but I can only imagine, I can only imagine Owen, how many people don't have a son who speaks English and he's outside and who, whose story is not never heard to the world. I can imagine how tens or even hundreds died of medical neglect because the Israeli army have decided not to allow ambulances and because the Israeli army have decided to destroy hospitals. And we've seen today the pictures of Shifa hospital and how it's completely devastated. And it's a really, really uh, uh, difficult and uh, horrific situation. And it's really shameful that our world has turned a blind eye to this stratosis. 
I mean, you know, I, I've been thinking about this a lot, this normalisation of actually extreme atrocities and war crimes, because you, you'd have thought before the genocidal onslaught against Gaza, there might have been a consensus over the destruction of a entire territory's medical system. And, um, you know, I remember Al Shifa Hospital towards the beginning, there was this dispute about whether or not it had been bombed by a misfired Islamic Jihad rocket and a, or, or an Israeli missile. And the point there is the reason there was so much controversy over that, and this was back in October, was that it was understood that bombing a hospital is one of the worst possible things that you can do. And even if, as the argument would be, and obviously we we saw with Al Shifa repeated claims that it was being used. I mean, the the IDF's claim was it was the main headquarters of Hamas. That's what they actually tweeted out. Uh, no evidence was ever provided. The Washington Post did a detailed rebuttal actually of the claims. Um, and yet, not only was subsequent to that controversy over one bombing with Al Shifa Hospital, um, after that, the entire healthcare system has been destroyed. I mean, Gaza no longer has a healthcare system. Al Shifa Hospital is is rubble. There's been a mass slaughter of of, of patients and, and and also doctors and nurses throughout Gaza, and it just seems it's this normalisation, isn't it? It's of things which before there was an agreement that attacking one hospital, and even if it was used, even if you could produce evidence it was being used for military means, any attack has to be under international law proportionate um, um, to a military aim. But all hospitals are being attacked. I mean, how just watching that, I mean, you know, what goes through your head, I suppose, just that we, you, the, where you've grown up, a, a healthcare system has been destroyed. And now we've normalized the idea that you can just wipe out a healthcare system, enti entire hospitals, and without the whole world screaming in outrage. I think, I think, yeah, I mean, obviously the first to blame is Israel for these actions, but the second to blame is the US and the Western backers. I mean, the fact that they couldn't, you know, say a word about the fact that Biden and even spokesperson of State Department repeatedly, this Israeli propaganda of central command of Hamas, etc., even when there were evidence, it's, it's just disgusting. I mean, they're, they're to blame, I think, in the same way is to, to blame Israel. But as you said, I mean, let's assume even, let's assume for the sake of the argument that there were Hamas members in this, in this, uh, in this hospital. Let's say one or two or three that they were there. The, the international humanitarian law is very, very, very clear. You cannot target place even if there are military people there, even if there are militants there. You can target it or count it as a military target only under one condition that is being used to target military, uh, to, sorry, it's being used as a military, uh, active military uh, uh, base, meaning that you have to actually fire from the hospital or fire rockets from there. And there is there is a reason why all these international humanitarian law was developed, because we are progressing toward a better world. We are progressing supposedly to a what's so called a civilized world. This is the civilized world that they've been telling us about it. There is this whole notion that there is a civilized and there against uncivilized. But I am afraid to say that what's so-called a civilization, what's so-called a civilization, as it portrayed itself in Gaza, is a mockery of a civilization. It's nothing but barbarianism for, as far as I'm concerned. I, I do not think that a civilized world can watch, and not only watch, but defend and go their speakers and the spokesperson to talk to us about how this is uh, used by, by Hamas's commands, etc. when there is no evidence whatsoever. It's really, really shameful. I mean, that point just, I mean, the West's moral authority for much of the world was treated with a, a great deal of cynicism, given the history of Western colonialism and the, the impact of Western colonialism. But nonetheless, you know, moral power is kind of one of the underpinnings of, of Western hegemony, the kind of moral claims it's made. When you see the, I mean, if we look at Gaza, the total devastation of civilian infrastructure, the destruction of the hospital system, which imposes in itself a death sentence on vast numbers of people. And you mentioned, obviously, what the horrible, the, you know, what happened to your father. There are lots of people in Gaza with cancer. There are people with heart problems. There are pregnant women. There is no longer a functioning healthcare system. That will impose a death sentence every single day on vast numbers of people. You can't have a modern society with a healthcare system. It doesn't work. Um, that alone will kill vast numbers of people for a very, very long time. Famine. You know, we just, we could go on. Um, 
you know, the fastest collapse in nutritional status of a population in recorded mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just, you look at that and think, what is the legacy in terms of Western power and what's actually going, you know, what's in terms of the Palestinians of Gaza and, but beyond the impact of, you know, these things cannot be unseen and unlearned. This is a big educational moment for people in the worst possible way. And what, what impact do you think that's going to have? I think the impact that's going to happen is an impact that we already have been seeing in the Middle East, but it would even double and triple. Uh, that is the disillusion of, uh, with international law, the disillusion with Western values, democracy, etc. There has been so long, for so long, uh, all sorts of movements in the Middle East that rejects these notions, rightfully, for seeing the hypocrisy in Israel, in, in, in Israel and Palestine, for seeing the hypocrisy of what happened in the Second Intifada, for seeing the hypocrisy of what happened even in the Iraq invasion in the region and other wars as well. There is a very clear hypocrisy that you look and you see it. And for people who tend to be more liberals like myself, people who still believe in the ideas of democracy, individual liberty, etc., we used to be looked at uh, and mocked, and I would always defend and say, well, yes, there are all these problems, but perhaps this is better than the alternative. Look at Russia, this is better than Russia. Look at China, this is better than China. I am afraid to say at this moment that people like myself look like fools. That yes, perhaps we were wrong. Perhaps everything that we believed about international human rights uh, and, and international human rights law, perhaps the international law and the, the Western powers, government values, perhaps they're all fake. They're not really uh, applicable. They don't really apply for people who look like me. And this is really a problem because this will have ramification for the future. There will be all sorts of movements that reject these notions completely. There will be all sorts of movements who adopt violence because explain to me why. Why shall an average kid in Gaza who witnessed his family being slaughtered in front of his eyes, why shall he not grow one thing to fight back and carry out guns? But not only that, look at as far as even the public opinion in Tunisia after the uh, uh, invasion of Gaza and, and the genocidal attack in Gaza, how it changed. It used to be, and this is this is fun because the Arab Barometer was doing this survey one day before uh, October 7, and then it's by chance, and these are the best kind of polls, when, when, when something happens by chance and you see the changes, it used to be the Palestinian question and uh, in relationship to the relationship with America and their views of America, quite positive of their view on America. Just after the attack in Gaza, we've seen decre in, like, you know, decrease in a way that is dramatic on how they look in America, and the reason why, as the report shows, it's because the attack on Gaza. So imagine how much people around this region will hate America, will not like America. And then, you know, the Americans and the Westerners will be crying, oh, they hate us just because who we are. Well, no, we don't hate you because who you are. People don't hate you because who you are. People hate you because your, your, your political system has failed to produce the values that you claim to promote in that region. And I am um, afraid that, that these things will continue as long as this uh, really corrupt uh, political uh, actors continue to draft to to, to drag uh, uh, not only the Palestinians and the people of the region but also they're dragging the American people the British people themselves to a place where no one likes before I ask you my final question about the future um in terms of uh, just in terms of where generally is there any hope before I ask you that in terms of the Christians of Gaza who have lived there, for nearly as long as the entire Christian religion has existed. Mm -hmm. What do you see the future in terms of, or the fate of the Christians of, of Gaza? What, do, what for, for your family um, and, and for, for their co-believers? I wrote an article for the New Arab Arms where I said basically that's the first time since uh, 2000 years where Gaza actually faced a danger of uh, extinction for uh, 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 the Christians there. For the first time, I think that it is very, very plausible that there will be no Christians left after this war. About 3% of the Christians in Gaza have been killed by the Israeli attacks. About 3%. We don't know how much injured, probably more than 3%. Uh, about 4% of the Christians in Gaza uh, who managed to bay on the borders have already been able to, left, to leave. And almost everyone, everyone who I talked to at the Catholic Church at the Orthodox Church in, in, in Gaza are saying we want to leave the Gaza Strip as, as soon as we can, whether during the war or after the war. Why? Because even if the war stops tomorrow, the conditions that Israel has created on the ground does not allow people to continue to live there. 
the collapse of the healthcare system, the collapse of the education system. There are no functioning universities in Gaza anymore. Why would anyone want to live in such a devastated city? So that's that's the very uh, uh, sad thing is that I think that the future of Palestinian Christians in Gaza is quite dark. I mean, many will listen to all of this and think, what hope is there? What possible hope? And I suppose, you know, in terms of any a, a possible solution based on, on, on peace and justice and equality where the land is shared by all those who live there on that basis, mm. what, what possible hope do you see? The truth is I don't see hope in the near future. I, I do think that I've always thought that the two-state solution is the only possible solution, not because it's the most just, it's actually unjust. It means that we have to compromise as Palestinians on 78% uh, uh, of our land, etc. But I thought it's the most possible. It does not take a lot from Israel, actually. It actually even saves Israel some money to withdraw to the 67 border. And it doesn't take a lot from uh, uh, fr from the Palestinians to to also like make uh, uh, certain compromises on that. However, I do think that if this war, if we emerge out of this war without two-state solution, uh, uh, I do think that the two-state solution is already dead and there wouldn't be a two-state solution. But here's the thing. I do not think even that uh, what the Americans are calling right now a pathway to two-state solution will lead us to anywhere. We've had a lot of pathways. Oslo was a pathway. Uh, uh, other uh, deals that were proposed in Camp David, et cetera, were a pathway. We either need a two-state solution now, like right now, right away at a cognition of a Palestinian state, et cetera, or I think there would not be a two-state solution. And the alternative to that will have to be a one-state solution. However, unlike other optimistic uh, analysts and thinkers who are thinking that the two-state solution will come through just peace and love and solidarity with, with each other, I do not think that if the two-state solution dies, that the alternative will be one-state solution through, you know, uh, some sort of common solidarity between people. No, it will be, it will come through a lot, a lot of blood, and a lot of violence, because here's the thing, there is one group that is dominant over the other and has all the power. That's, these are Israeli Jews. There's one group that is really, really weak and does not have any power, and those are the Palestinians. And the dominant group does not seem to signal anything or any sign that they are willing to give up power. And I'm afraid that this put us in an inevitable situation where we need a lot of violence and a lot of blood to produce a new... Uh, uh, sort of imaginary polity to to be able to build that that polity. That's how, unfortunately, world history uh, 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 teaches us. And it looks it looks very dark unless, obviously, the Western power really put pressure in Israel to establish two state solution tomorrow. But unfortunately, I don't see them doing this. Well, it's a sobering place to end. But the reality is what the reality is, and it's it's really important that we have these difficult um, conversations and. Khalil, honestly, it's such an honor to speak to you. You've, it's you know, many of us again. We've listened to so many Palestinian voices. We've 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 seen all these horrors, and yet it still, I think, it becomes quite difficult for us to process the level of trauma that you and other, others have gone through. And you've spoken so eloquently and, and movingly, and with so much insight about the plight of the Palestinian people and about your family, your community, and and, and Gaza and beyond. Um, so we're really, really grateful. Do make sure Khalil's voice is heard. Do share this video, press like, uh, subscribe. Um, because honestly, it was a, it was a big, big honor. So thanks, Khalil. Thanks so much. Thank you, Owen. I really appreciate you having me.